This week's speaker is Lowell. He works in the high performance computing uh, division of LANL. And he has come today to talk about Git and using that for version control. Um, this is a talk or a version of a talk that he gives to LANL summer students most years, um, cut down and tailored to us. So I will let him finish introducing himself and introduce the concept of Git. As usual, you guys can interrupt to ask him questions or you can type your questions in the speaker channel and I will interrupt as it makes sense. All you, Lowell. Great, thanks. I'm gonna actually try to turn on my camera just for a moment so you can see the person talking at you, but uh, I'm not going to leave it on throughout. So let's see. Okay, is it gonna let me? Yep. Hi, I'm sitting outside. This is me, I'm Lowell. Um, as Liz mentioned, I um, work at Los Alamos National Lab, which it sounds like most of the people you're hearing from do, which is not terribly surprising, I guess. Um, and I'm actually going to just jump ahead on the slide deck to the slide that was about who is me. Uh, who is this Lowell Wofford guy? So I work at LANL. I design bits of supercomputers, so not games. Um, uh, a, a bit of a, a fun fact, though, I, I started programming in about 1987, specifically because I wanted to make my own games. Uh, I was about six years old. Um, <laughs> and uh, I don't make games anymore. But I really learned a lot from making games. So I, I think there's a, a lot of sort of side knowledge that can be picked up here. And I'm going to pause for a moment and make sure, can people see my, my slide here? OK, good, good. All right, I am actually going to kill my video if it's still going. Sorry, I'm, I'm not familiar with Discord, so. Kind of a new experience for me, uh, j just to lower the bandwidth here. All right, let's get back to this. <clears throat> so I have a bit of an agenda for today, uh, and uh, I, I know this, this this doesn't sound anywhere near as flashy as, as doing things like um, uh, sound editing for games or uh, visual design, but I'm going to be talking about a very core piece of technology that you're almost certainly going to want to use with much of your design work. Um, so we're going to learn about version control systems. Uh, do we do we have a way to do like a show of hands thing? Is that possible? Sadly, no, but I think everyone can just uh, speak up in speakers and I can give you an idea. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just curious how how many of you are, are familiar with concepts like version control or specifically Git? So I got one. <laughs> no, that's good. I'm just trying to, to, to judge who, who I'm talking to here so I make sure I don't spend a lot of time uh, rambling on about things that you already understand. Um, so we're going to learn about version control systems and specifically why you would need them. Uh, we're going to learn about Git, which is a particular version control system. They're one of many. Um, and uh, I'll, towards the end, I'll give you a little interactive demo of Git. Uh, and then at the very end, uh, initially I'd hoped this was a thing that we could kind of do as, as a group. I don't think it makes sense. But I have a link that I'm going to encourage all of you to follow that will guide you through some sort of guided tutorials, and that's where you'll actually have an opportunity to really learn some Git, learn to actually use the tool. Um, any questions about what we're doing? So I wanted to take a minute before we actually dove in to, to uh, set some expectations here about, um, uh, what did I title this? What to expect to get from this Git getting. Um, <laughs> So uh, the very first thing to note is you're not actually going to learn Git from these slides. I cannot teach you Git in the next hour. Uh, that's what the thing at the end is for. Um, so don't worry about that. Um, we, we, we have other resources for that. Uh, I want to focus on some concepts and some terms so that when you encounter them as you 
poke around at the tutorials and so on later. Um, they don't sound too unfamiliar. Um, so there are a couple of core concepts here, things like version control and just file management. Um, and, uh, and try to make sure you come out of this with a sense of what those terms mean and why they matter. And then, and then there are specific terms that come up in terms of version control and specifically Git. And it's going to help you a lot as you try to work your way through tutorials and so on, if you can come away with this with a, a kind of an understanding of what these terms mean. So this is really the goal for what we're going to go through in these slides. We're not going to learn Git, but hopefully you get that kind of, oh, you said repository. I kind of remember what that means. Uh, and, and so as you're going through tutorials and so on, um, it's not too unfamiliar. And uh, I highly encourage you to interrupt me either through text or voice and ask questions. Um, chances are if you have a question, someone else has the same question. Uh, so we'll start by talking about version control systems with a specific focus on, on game development. Um, and uh, well, let's just launch in. So, um, as I think hey, you've probably, yeah. yeah. Have you been advancing your slides? Because we're still seeing the agenda slide, or at least I am. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yes, I have been. Uh, okay, what are we going to do about this? Let's see. There we go. Uh, did that make something change? Yeah. Okay. All right. I don't know. Was it frozen for everyone? Okay. okay. Um, you know what I think is happening here is when I actually go into slide play mode, I think it stops tracking my screen. Sure it does, because that's helpful. Yeah. So what we're going to do is I'm going to present in this mode, and we're going to be okay with that. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. So I'll pop back just to prove that I had slides for, for the other stuff I was talking about. <laughs> Um, uh, well, since you didn't have the things to look at as I was talking about them, any questions about that before I actually talk about version control systems? Okay, let's talk about version control systems. But first, let's talk about games at a very, very, very high level uh, with the noted caveat that I am not a game developer. Um, so um, there are a lot of pieces to games, and it sounds like you've already learned about some of those pieces, and you're going to be learning about other pieces. Uh, but just to catalog a couple of them, you're going to have some graphics, like like this familiar little guy here, Mr. Uh, Mr. That's Luigi, I believe. Um, <laughs> uh, you'll probably have some sounds and music. Uh, and these are all files uh, that, that are involved in your game. So we're, we're already starting to build up some files. Um, but one of the things that may or may not yet be obvious is you're also going to have a whole lot of files full of text. Uh, that text might be things like uh, programming source code of some kind. It could be an actual programming language or a scripting language for a game engine. Um, which could include things like game logic. And there's really just a whole lot of other stuff that goes into it that all fall under this heading of sort of human readable files that you have a whole bunch of. So to put some parameters on that, let's look at a case study. Uh, probably some of you have heard of Unreal Engine. You've probably heard of it because it powers some of the most popular games out there like Fortnite, Ark, Borderlands, Final Fantasy, the big ones, the big fancy flashy ones, right? Uh, it's also used in movie rendering and all kinds of stuff like that too, as it turns out. So Unreal Engine is, is a thing that you can actually go get all of the, the code that makes it up. Um, but um, what it is ultimately is a, a set of tools for, for rendering graphics, for doing animation, for handling physics, um, even for playing audio, things like that. Um, I'm guessing you're not going to be, as part of this project, making a, a super, super realistic 3D you know, first-person shooter game or something like that. But this is the kind of tool that you would use if you were doing something like that. And the point here is that if you pull it down and you look at it, 
the Unreal of 137,994 files. It's a lot of files. Um, and you're going to have to have ways as you deal with these files of managing them. And in the next couple of slides, I'll talk about a couple of different ways in which I mean managing them. So as I said, that's a lot of smile, <laughs> smiles, files. Um, so here's a scenario. Imagine this. So you're working on your game, and you wanted to add a level to your game. You created some, some logic, some textures, some animations, maybe some sounds and maps and various things that go into your game. And let's say that accumulated to 10 files. And then while you're at it, you had to modify the game engine you're using in some way. Maybe just to, to say, hey, make this level part of my overall game, something like that. And so you have another five files, and you're going to test it out, and you, and you try to run it, and you, your game just crashes. It doesn't work anymore, and you don't know why. And the way you've done things, you don't even remember what you changed. Um, so what are you going to do? You have to somehow trace your way back and figure out what files you changed and what you need to revert to make it all work again. Um, and so another way of putting that, getting to what we're really talking about here, is we need to keep something of a journal of, of, of what we changed and what the, what the changes were for. And we need to have a way to go back when things break. So that's a very baseline kind of requirement. Let's look at another uh, sort of extension on this this scenario. To make things even worse, it's not just me anymore. Uh, uh, say three of my friends and I are working on a game. We've got one person who, who makes the logic for the game. We've got mon one person making sprites for the game. Do people know the word sprites? Am I using a word people don't know? Ah, we know sprites. Okay. Um, we have somebody making maps and say, I'm making game engine tweaks. And we all this time went off to make this level, each doing our separate pieces. But how are we supposed to take all of our pieces and merge them together? I mean, some of us might have even modified the same files out of those 137,000 files. Or maybe you have a much more modest engine that only has 100 files. But... Um, we may have touched the same things. How do we take all of our work and push it together, merge it all together, uh, and, and make it all work? And then, especially complicated, what if something broke? At this point, we not only don't know what files necessarily have been modified in what ways, we don't even know who did it. Right? We don't know uh, whose piece caused the break necessarily. Uh, we really need a way to track all of this information. So, enter the uh, the main event here, version control systems. Uh, ultimately, version control systems, incidentally, are just a fancy way of, of saying a tool that solves the problems we've be just been talking about. Uh, they generally do it by allowing to you to see a history of changes that have been made, uh, usually including who made the changes and when and lots of details like that. They allow you to roll back to old versions um, they allow you to take uh, changes from multiple sources and merge them together. Uh, so, for instance, your level that you just made with your friends, you can now take all of those and merge them into one place. Uh, and they allow you to keep track of different uh, branches. This is actually one of those terms I was talking about of changes, which is to say you could manage, say, um, you could have one group of friends that are going off to uh, work on level five of your game, and another group of friends are getting ahead of themselves and going off and working on level six, and they can work independently, and we can merge those changes together later. Uh, usually they do a whole lot more. This is a, a kind of an extreme oversimplification of what most of the tools do. But it is a large portion of what you're likely to carry about, care about uh, initially here. Um, I want to point out this little picture on the side. It's not not just a, I was going to say pretty picture. I don't know that it's that pretty of a picture. It's um, But it's not just fluff. It's a way to start thinking about 
the concepts that I listed on, on the left-hand side here. Now, if I move my pointer around, do you see it? Yep. Okay. So the way you're supposed to look at a diagram like this, and you'll see diagrams like this if you go work through the tutorials and so on. So it takes makes sense to uh, uh, take a moment to kind of stare at it and, and make sure we understand what's going on here. The way it works is time moves from left to right in this diagram, okay? And each little circle here, you can think of a point in time in your project of files. Um, every time you see one of these little diversions here, that's this thing called branches we were talking about. Now, I doubt you're going to really use branches much, but it's good to at least get a, a an understanding of... Um, what people mean when they say it. Um, so if you look at this line here, we start over here with this little blue dot and we make a branch and then there's another point in time here at this little orange dot. Um, and then uh, you can see that later on, there's this line that brings the orange dot back to this next little blue dot. That represents the merging concept that we were talking about. So what happened here is someone branched off of this point in time, made some changes, and then pushed those changes back in to make a new point in time for this sort of main timeline here at the top. I'm going to pause there for, for a second, uh, hoping someone raises a question. I think... Um, being able to read this diagram is somewhat the same as understanding what we're trying to accomplish here. So what do the different colors mean? So in this particular diagram, so particular diagram uh, that, that's a great question. Um, a great question. The, the colors aren't universal. The colors aren't universal. Um, uh, it's a it's an artifact of this specific diagram, how it's made, but they are actually representing something. Um, and it was something that it wasn't necessarily going to go into, but you asked, so I will. Um, so we're using colors to represent different sort of uh, development timelines on different branches for different purposes. If you look at the, the little chart up here at the top, you see that master uh, is associated with this blue branch. Uh, this chart's a little outdated. We mostly shifted to using main instead of master. but um, And that usually just refers to your main line. This is your, your main thing that most people are going to use. Or if it's just you, it's the main thing that you trust and you use. Um, the orange thing associates with what they're calling a hot fix. That's a term people sometimes use for, I need to make a quick fix. So you see it branches off and immediately merges back in. So that's a hot fix flow. Um, then if you look at purple, it's associated with develop. A, a very common practice um, in, in just gener generically software development is to maintain one of these branches where more experimental work is done. And then occasionally, gets itself merged back into that main branch uh, when it's ready. So it's like an ongoing separate timeline where changes occasionally get pushed back into that main branch. Does that make sense? I hope. It does to me. <laughs> <laughs> And that's more of a um, how people tend to use version control rather than a version control necessarily works in this particular use pattern. It's just how people often use it. So there are lots of different version control systems out there. I mentioned that before. I mentioned some of these here just so you can see that I'm not lying and that there are, in fact, some other ones. Um, there's a very old one called revision control system called R or RCS. Everybody just calls it RCS. There's current, I'm sorry, concurrent versioning system, CVS. Subversion, also known as SVN, Mercurial, and actually a really long list, like probably at least 20, maybe 30 different uh, minor tools out there. So the point of seeing a list like this is to realize that as we start talking about Git, Git is not the only way these are all just tools. They're tools that you could choose to use. Um, 
and they all aim at solving the same basic set of problems. And one where And I'd like to know yeah. when when Lowell says oldish, <laughs> CVS was old when I was in college more than 20 years ago. <laughs> and SVN is what I used when I was in college more than 20 years ago. <laughs> And it was so much simpler and so much nicer, but did almost nothing compared to Git. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I also do want to emphasize uh, not to uh, uh, confuse the concept of version control with any particular tool that does it. They're all things, jumping back for a minute, that try to allow you to do workflows like this diagram is describing. But we're going to talk about Git specifically. Why? Because it's really popular. It's also very powerful. Uh, this isn't why, but it's a uh, fun incidental fact for any of you who are familiar with the Linux operating system. It was made by the same guy. Um, and it's what we're going to do. So that kind of wraps up what I was going to say generically about version control before talking specifically about Git. Uh, any questions about version control generically or why we want it or why we care? Yeah, why should I, who's just working on a game by myself, messing around, care? Yeah, so I, I think really the um, the answer for that is mostly this example, if we jump back, which is... Um, uh, you can think of version control as providing you point in time backups of your work. And I can tell you that when I go mess around with things, I always break them. It's one of the funnest things you can do. You should break things. It's, it's how you learn things. But when you break things, it's also good to be able to revert back to something that isn't broken. So I think that's probably the main reason. Uh, there are secondary reasons, I would say. Um, one of them is I can look at a, a journal of what I've done using version control as I get these point in time snapshots that we were talking about, these, these commits, I can look back in time and see, oh, this is what I worked on and this is when I did it. So that's also helpful. But the big one is, oh no, I broke everything. I guess in that sense, it's a sort of backup. I guess in that sense, it's a sort of backup. Hello? Anything else before we talk about Git? Before we talk about Git. Yes. All right. Let's <laughs> talk about Git. Right. Let's talk about Git. So I want to warn. So I uh, warn. everything I've said so far is very yeah, sort of high level so and far, theoretical. Sort of high Some level. of the things in the next couple of slides yes, get. Yes, that would slides, be. In some cases, uh, quite technical. Um, quite and technical. I want to. Um, I want, yeah, remind, I want to just remind, the idea is not that you understand every detail of, these slides, detail of these slides, but rather that you start picking up this terminology and these concepts that we use when we talk about Git. If you can understand some of these concepts, when you start actually trying to use it, you'll get a lot less confused. Uh, because I will say, it's a very common complaint when people start using Git that it can be very confusing. Even, say, co-workers of mine. Um, all right, so what is Git? We kind of covered this already, um, but I'm going to cover it slightly differently here. Um, so at the top, you can see what Git says that it is, and it doesn't sound very helpful. Git is a free and open source distributed version control system designed to handle everything from small to very large projects with speed and efficiency. Um, lots of words in that that probably don't mean a whole lot, like distributed for instance, and of course, you know, if, if you're seasoned with Git, you'll know what they're talking about there, but I wouldn't worry about it too much. Let's try to break it down into things that are a little bit more meaningful. Uh, so first of all, Git is a tool. It's a command line tool, which is to say you type words in a terminal type tool uh, to, uh, well, I should correct. There are graphical front ends for Git, but at the core, it's a, it's a command line tool. Uh, that provides version control in the sense that we were just talking about for directories of files. Uh, we call these things repositories. So that's a, it's a very bolded and quoted word because it's an important one. 
So we don't even talk about them as directories anymore once once they're in the Git universe. When people talk about Git, they talk about this repository and that repository. And the important thing to keep in mind is what a repository is, is a directory of files that are being controlled by Git. Uh, Git is free and open source, which I point out here because it's great that it's free and open source, but it also means that there shouldn't be any barrier to you being able to go play with it. It's one of the reasons we use it. Uh, Git is fast and efficient, so uh, it could handle those 137,000 files of Unreal Engine. Not only could it, it actually, the Unreal Engine actually is version controlled using Git. Uh, Git has been the most popular solution since about 2010. Uh, so I guess Git itself is not all that new anymore, but it's still the sort of state of the art. Um, so that's one reason to dig into it, because as you do anything with any kind of game or software or whatever project, I actually use it to manage documents personally. Um, it, uh, it's going to be a tool that is going to be used wherever you go. Um, and then it's also been made super popular by websites like github.com and bitbucket.com. And I'm guessing at least somebody here has probably stumbled across github.com before. Am I right? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> that's all right. That's the point. That's why we're doing this, right? <laughs> um, so uh, the next slide is, in fact, what is GitHub? So uh, GitHub's really important. Uh, GitHub is not Git, um, but it's a super, super popular website. Um, and so people actually often who aren't familiar with Git or GitHub really get the two confused. They are actually different things. Um, GitHub is a website dedicated to hosting Git repositories. There's that word again, repositories. Again, repository, directory of files that Git controls. You can host those online at github.com. Um, uh, you use Git itself to work with github.com, but they're, again, two different things. Um, and GitHub is popular because it offers some extra add-on features, most of which uh, you're not going to care about right now, but we're mentioning. Um, I guess the, the one that you might care about is it's a huge community of uh, mostly open source developers. So a lot of the software that you probably touch, whether it's actually open source or not open source, likely lives on GitHub somewhere. Uh, and the developers that make that software probably put it on GitHub and manage it there. There are other options, but just, you know, if you were to roll the dice, there's a good chance that it lives on GitHub. Um, uh, most publicly available software, I think it's safe to say, lives there. And once again, Unreal Engine actually lives on GitHub. It's not public, but I, if you wanted it, you actually can go set up an Unreal Engine account and they'll give you access. That's how I knew how many files there were. I did that and counted the files. <clears throat> Excuse me a second. It also adds on a bunch of features, and we're not really going to talk about them, but you may, you may hear the term pull request at some point in the future. And the thing to know about a pull request is it's a special thing that GitHub adds to Git to make collaboration easier. And if... Someday want to go make a change to a public project. They're probably going to ask you to create one of these pull request things, but don't worry about it for now. Okay, let's be more specific about what Git does. Um, and again, I want to emphasize what we're trying to do here is develop this terminology. So at the end of each of if you the ever time, someday want to terms. And what you should read that as is the most important thing in that line is understanding that these terms are associated with these concepts. So um, Git manages a revision history of a directory full of stuff. And the terms that tend to be associated with that are commits and checkouts. We'll learn more about them again later. The idea is just start recognizing the words. Git can synchronize that directory with other directories. 
this is how you collaborate. This Terms collaborate. around this are are things like cloning, pushing, pulling, um, and actually remotes should probably have made the list. Um, Git can manage multiple histories of one directory. So you want to go try a uh, completely random experiment that you know is going to break everything, totally fine. We can maintain a separate history, and we can go back to our main history at a later time. And this is, we've already kind of talked about it, largely that concept of branching. Um, also tagging, that's slightly different. Um, Git provides tools for collaboratively working on directories. Uh, so we already mentioned the idea of merging work together. There's another term called rebasing that we're not going to touch. It's one of the more advanced Git features, but it's good to know the word. Um, but definitely one of the things you would do if you weren't working alone is merge changes. Or here's an alternative. Maybe you went off and you did your crazy experiment. You knew that it was going to break everything in another branch. And then at the end, you realized it was actually really amazing and you wanted to make it part of the main branch. You would merge those changes in. Um, you probably won't care about this one as much, though you know, deep down maybe you should. It also provides assurances that stuff is still intact. So that makes sure that files didn't get corrupted and things like that. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm getting a bit of dry mouth here. Um, <clears throat> so this is where we get into some really technical stuff. Again, word recognition. So how does Git do what it does? Um, so it stores a local re repository, probably bad word choice, a local collection of information in a special directory within your directory called dot .git. Um, I mentioned this in part because I'm actually going to show you that directory when I do the little demo in a little bit. Uh, it puts this in the in the base directory of your repository. Uh, I should note, I say repo here, common lingo, repository, repo, same thing. Um, this includes a bunch of config information. You know, it's tracking all of this information. We mentioned it keeps a, a journal of the changes over time. This is where it keeps all of that information. It also keeps information about other places that you might want to synchronize your changes uh, that are called remotes. Um, it keeps uh, snapshots in time of the actual contents of the directory. And these snapshots in time are referred to as a commit. So I'm going to jump back really quick to somewhere here. We were talking about these little dots as being snapshots in time. What I really meant when I was saying that is these are specific git commits. Wrong slide. There we go. Um, and then finally, and this is one of those things that seems like a nitpicky little detail until you realize you see it all the time. It keeps a pointer to the current snapshot in time, the current commit, and that's referred to as the head of the repository. And this is the important bit. It populates the directory with its contents. That might be a little confusing. Git actually stores all of the data you're tracking within that .git folder, and the actual contents of the directory can be changed by Git or completely um, blown away by Git and restored by Git. So um, whatever is that head is what's currently actually the files that are currently existing in your directory. This is pretty... Um content dense stuff. So if anyone has any questions right now, feel free to pop in. Yes, please do. But again, I, I'll keep repeating it. The main thing here is to try to grasp some of the core concepts and terms that we refer to, because when you go play with the tutorial uh, after this, you're going to see the word head and hopefully it rings a bell and you're like, oh, I get what that's saying, at least to some extent. Okay. 
I'm going to, um, mostly gloss over some of the stuff in this, but there are some things that I wanted to highlight. One of the important things to understand, especially when you're thinking about things like github.com and where does that repository live? Does it live on GitHub? Is ultimately when you're working with Git, you're working with a directory on the computer you're working on, on your laptop or whatever you have. Git works locally. When you operate on Git, you're doing things locally. It's not, it's not automatically synchronized with the GitHub project you touched or your friend's project that you're synchronizing with or anything like that. It is managing a local directory. Um, there are ways that you can synchronize out, and that this, this slide is mostly to stare at, that you can see that you can push changes out to elsewhere. You can fetch or check out or merge changes from elsewhere. But ultimately, Git is a way to manage a local directory on your computer. <clears throat> this one is also very important as you start doing things with this tool because you're going to try to do stuff and it's going to complain that you're in the wrong state. So what do we mean by that? There are essentially three states this directory of stuff can be in. Everything can be sort of good and clean and as, they, as this says, committed, which says that everything you see in your directory has been recorded in your journal of changes. Um, this would be the state you would land in if you actually just probably copied somebody else's existing project, for instance, or if you just committed all of your changes. Um, that is, you, you told it to make a snapshot of the current state of things. Again, that's what we mean when we say commit. Um, modified means, that you've changed a file and Git doesn't know about it yet. It knows that you've modified it, but you haven't made a snapshot of that change yet. And staged is kind of an in-between one that says, you made a change, you told me that you want to make a snapshot that includes that change, but you haven't done it yet. And finally, we get to what is maybe the most important thing to get out of all of this, which is the basic workflow that all of this adds up to. So I want to make sure that we get through this one and it's understood. As Liz said, this is pretty content dense stuff, so do interrupt. So the first thing we have to do is, uh, I, I'm going to ignore the second case I have here. We're, we're going to assume that you're creating this project. You have a directory full of stuff and you've decided you want to start keeping track of changes inside that directory. So you go into the directory, and the first thing you do, and all of these are actual commands that you would run in the directory, though they're all prefixed with the word git. So it's git, you would init the new repo, which is to say, uh, of course that's short for initialize, uh, you would say git init inside your directory, and that tells git this is a place that I'm going to control now. The next thing you would do is you would potentially create, delete, modify some files in that directory. You know, maybe you're you're you know tweaking something in your game logic and modifying files to do that. You would uh, add the files. Uh, so this is again a git command, git add, and then the file, and, and that tells git that this is a file that you should be tracking now. And the next time I tell you to make a snapshot, include this file. Again, there's that staged word. And then finally, you would actually commit changes. Now we've made an actual snapshot in time. This is a snapshot in time that I could go make a bunch of other changes and I can roll back to whenever I want. So that's the core of the workflow. And then the next thing is you could, you know, repeat ad nauseum. You could repeat and repeat and repeat, which is to say you go modify new stuff uh, and you uh, add them and commit those changes and keep, keep making more snapshots. Or other possibilities of things you might want to do are push those commits somewhere else. Say if you're working with a friend or you're using something like GitHub, you might want to synchronize those changes up, you might say. 
Um, you could check out, again, an actual term that we use for get. You could check out an old commit. Uh, that would allow you to jump back in time to that old commit. You could pull someone else's changes from elsewhere. Uh, now, I imagine that in what you're doing, the push-pull stuff is not stuff you're likely to be doing immediately anyway. Um, but it's good to know that you can do those. Those are the commands that would allow you to synchronize changes in multiple places. Checkout, on the other hand, is one that you might use. You might use checkout to jump back in time and get a sense of where things were. Or, you know, if you broke everything, you might jump back in time because you want an unbroken directory. So if you jump back in time and then you keep making changes, it'll save. Is that making a copy of where you were or is that going and changing? It's a great question. So it... Um, what it does, what you end up actually doing, if you if you want to go back in time and then make changes on top of that, as you end up creating a branch, and we're not going to really, talk, I mean, we've talked about branches in a conceptual way. We're not going to, I mean, this is this is right now the depth at which we're going to go into actual operations to do and get. But yes, if you wanted to jump back in time and start making changes, you jump back in time, and then you'd make a new branch of history to make changes on. So let's get a visual on that, shall we? So jumping back here. So let's see, do they do this anywhere? No. Well, but I can make it work. You see this is v0.2 here. So say I'm here in time, and I want to go back to... You know, I broke something between these two commits here. So I can jump back in time to this commit, okay? And then I can branch off and start making changes here, and that's completely independent of this commit up here. Did that make sense? Did that make sense? And so then if you messed it up a second time, you can yeah. Uh, until you tell it to get rid of anything, Git keeps all of these. So I can, my my head of my directory can be at any one of these dots in this diagram, anywhere in, in history. And I can jump to any other dot in the diagram if I just know the sort of, the, the right thing to call it, the right incantation. I, I'm going to jump in one second. You said until you get rid of anything. I have never had a good reason for getting rid of anything in Git. Uh, do you have a good example? of? I have some examples that would be w way too obscure, I think, to, <laughs> to go into. I think okay. the basic point here is what for what expecting. any of you are going to do, and, and you'll know when it's time to know otherwise, I think. You'll never get rid of anything. Kind of like my email inbox. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so so you would keep all of these commits in history, which means, and, and you kind of get a sense of why this is a really awesome thing because it means I can play with all kinds of different changes, and it doesn't stop me. It doesn't destroy what I was working on. It doesn't keep me from working on something else entirely. And uh, whenever I feel like it, I can just jump between any of these points in history. Or even alternate histories, if you want to put it that way. Or even alternate histories, if you want to put it that way. Does that all make some sense? Does that all make some sense? Yeah. So this is the point at which I intended to jump off and do the demo. I'm happy to answer any more questions right now. But I think maybe seeing this thing do something might make some of these concepts become a little more concrete. Does that make sense? All right. I'm not going to do a sophisticated demo. This is going to be very simple because I think that's probably the best thing right now. Uh, I'm, I'm in my terminal here. Is that visible to everyone? Um, I, mm, okay. I might have to unshare and reshare. One second. I might have to unshare and reshare. Change windows. Let's do that. Change windows. Let's do that. 
do you see a a screen with some terminally text? I don't know if it, I don't know how many of you have ever actually used a terminal before. Yeah. Okay. I see a terminal, but I don't see any text. No text. On it. Hmm. There's just yeah, it's just the top right or top left corner. Okay. <laughs> Maybe my uh, maybe my full screen thing is uh, well here. Blocked so right we'll there. we'll bring that down a little bit. Hopefully you see that. So I'm going to go into, and you're going to be seeing me do a few terminal commands here that you may or may not have ever seen. Don't worry about those. Worry about the things that have Git in them. Uh, so I'm just going into a directory which I uh, so I'm just steam stream. So I made a, a directory for this. It's empty. So I just listed all the contents and there was nothing. That was the last thing I did. I want to make a Git controlled project. Thinking back to that workflow, thing I init. And it tells me I initialized an empty Git repository. It even tells me about this dot Git directory. And I can look, and there is in fact this dot Git thing there now. I can actually look in it and probably confuse myself. It's got a bunch of junk in there that, that you can learn about, but but it's not stuff that you're generally going to deal with. Just remember that's where it keeps track of all of your stuff. Um, one of the most basic things when you start using Git is to learn the Git status command. Remember I, I made a big deal about state a minute ago? That's what status tells you about. It tells you about your current state and one of the biggest mistakes you can make when working with Git is trying to do stuff when you don't understand what state you're in. That's how you get yourself confused. So I, I think it, it would be only a slight exaggeration to say that when you're using Git, you should probably just get status every other line. So uh, you see some mention of a branch here. Uh, it says there's no commits yet. We know what that means. There are no point in time snapshots yet. Well, of course there aren't. There's nothing even in the directory right now. Let's make something. I'm going to make a file. This file is a text file that says I'm a file. Now I have a thing that my Git can control. So remember the next part of the workflow is git add uh, wait, let me follow my own rule, git status. It actually tells me I have an untracked file. Now I can git add that file. The other thing here is that git will sometimes tell you what you might want to do next, like git add file. And now if I do git status, it says you have changes to be committed. That is, we have staged changes, but we are not in a committed state. Okay. So I can do a commit. I, I can say git. Um, there are multiple. I, I should say every one of these commands have many, many options. And as you use it more, you'll you'll figure them out. Uh, but we'll, for now, we're just going to say git commit. We want to make a point in time snapshot. OK? Uh, it wants me to give a log message. It doesn't know what I did without me telling it. I'm going to say I added a file. Um, you could also give this message when you gave the command. You could also give this message. And now I've added a file. Yep. And now I've added a file. Yep. Can I interrupt real quick, Lil? Yep. Um, yep. You'll, you guys, having never worked in a terminal, terminal uh, or very little work in a terminal, uh, the one detail right there is when you get that um, git commit message, you can really get into a messed up place because it'll pop you into VI, which is an editor that is uh, very interesting to use for people who have never used it. So when I put this recording up, I will give you the commands to use a um, much simpler editor with some That's explanations a good idea. as to why. No. Uh, Lowell may argue with me, long-term no. VI, is useful to learn, but short term while trying to learn Git, you don't want to go within. A totally file agree. Of totally VI agree. Kind of You're not trying to learn VI right now. Totally uh, and and honestly, when I I'm going to do one more commit before we're done here, and I'll show you how to just add the message when you do the commit, and that's usually how I do it. I don't use the editor at all. 
Yeah. Same here. I only use the editor right. and I accidentally yeah. forget to add the uh, the thing. So. So I I've mentioned several times that Git creates a journal, and we made a commit. You can see your journal with Git log. We actually call it a log, not a journal. Um, and you can see a whole bunch of stuff here. Uh, you can see that I made the change, right? Uh, you can see what the message, add a file was the message I gave it. You can see when I made it. And actually you can give this options to see a whole lot more or less stuff. The other thing to note, and we'll see this in a second, is this crazy looking string here of stuff is actually important. That's your unique identifier for that point in time. And it will never change. Um, okay. Uh, now I want to make one more little illustration here. I'm going to uh, I'm going to edit that file. I'm just going to put that there, kind of random. But now if I look at that file, you can see that it has changed. I can do my git status. And now it says, oh, you've got a modified file. Thinking back to that slide again, we are in modified state. Um, we know what we have to do. We want a point in time change for this. We can say git add file, git status again. And we see we're now in that staged state. So now we're at the point again where we can make another git commit. So we can git commit. This time I'm going to say dash m and say uh, second commit. That's just what I'm going to name this. I recommend coming up with maybe better explanations of your changes than I just did. But uh, we'll see that that dash M means it didn't pop up the editor. It just set that. And I can see that again, not lag, log by saying git log. And now you see that we have multiple points in time in our history. We have the point that I said add a file and we have the point that I said second commit. So when Lowell says you want more descriptive names, you're going to look for things like um, added the second level or changed the jump mechanic or various things that, that have marked. Exactly that right. Gotten to you want to be able to look at this log and know what happened. This is a message to yourself. So the last thing I'm going to show here is I've told you that you can jump around in time. Let's do it. We have two points in time. So I'm going to cat my file here. Cat just is how I see the contents of the file. Um, okay, so it's in the latest version that has the funny space and two in it. I don't like that. It, it, it was a bad change. Or maybe I just wanted to see what it used to look like. I can go back in time. I told you this crazy long string is important. I'm going to copy that string. And I'm going to say git checkout and that crazy long string. It dumps a bunch of stuff, but it did it. If I cat the file now, the crazy two is gone. So I've gone back in time, but wait, that doesn't mean I'm stuck there. I can go back to where I was too. Get checkout and the other crazy string, cat the file. And you can start to see that I can pretty easily with a combination of these crazy looking strings, and the the crazy looking string, I should just give the the word is hash with the hash uh, for the commit. I can jump back and forth to any point in time I can find in my log. Go pick it up. So that was a a whirlwind tour that again was not supposed to actually teach you to use Git directly but hopefully make some of the concepts in the slide a little more concrete, like that whole committed versus um, versus um, modified state thing and, and all of that stuff. Any questions about this? Anything you want me to show you how to do that I didn't? So the way I think you're actually going to use this is I'm going to give you a link that I encourage you all to follow and play around with. It's going to give you a nice detailed start from the beginning 
web-based way to do all of this. So it's going to, uh, I could actually show it to you, I suppose. Um, but that way you can just follow along and you're only going to learn it by doing the commands yourself. So that's, that's the thought there. And I cannot emphasize this enough. Git is a little bit frustrating to learn. Um, however, the time you put in learning it up front will dramatically change or affect the amount of time you spend recovering mistakes later on. It's not just I changed a file, it's I accidentally deleted Inkscape. Um, not Inkscape, but my file that I created in Inkscape or any number of things like that. So it's, it's super worthwhile if you're doing any project that's going to take you more than a day to work on to put in the work to actually understand this Git thing so that you can do things later. And as Lowell even said, he keeps documentation and other things on it as well. It's just a really worthwhile yep. tool. Totally to agree on all of that. Well. Yep. Totally agree on all of that. So this is the last slide. I jumped back to the slides just to, to show this. The link, there's got to be a way I can... Oh, goodness, what am I doing? There's got to be a way I can put this in the chat here. Where is the hashtag speakers where I do that? Where is the hashtag speakers okay. where I do that? All yep. right. So this is a totally free and really kind of a nice beginner tutorial to start actually using this. And I'm going to open it in a browser so you can see what I'm talking about. I also think it's good because then when you load it, it should look like what I loaded. And if it doesn't, we're at the long, wrong place. Um, change windows. This window. Go live. Okay. So it looks like this. And what you're going to want to do is go to start scenario, and you're going to want to start on scenario one. Scenario one is going to look pretty similar to what I just did as a demo. Click on that. And in a second, it should load this thing. Uh, I'm going to kind of click through. You should probably read the things it says here. Uh, but you'll say start scenario. And you can see over here in your browser, you should be able to run commands like git status. Um, and it's going to tell you not, you're not a git repository because, well, we haven't git initted yet. But this, if you just follow along the steps on the left-hand side, it's going to go in a lot more detail through all of those steps that I just did in the demo. And then when you're done with that, uh, how do I exit this thing? <laughs> um, leave page. That wasn't what I wanted either. When you're done with that, you can move on to scenario two and three and so on. And eventually you'll start getting... Uh, your own working knowledge of how to actually do stuff with Git. Your own working knowledge of how to actually do stuff with Git. Have people been able to actually uh, follow the link? Have people been able to actually uh, follow the link? I just Good. clicked on it and it worked for me. So that was the sum of what I thought we could cover in an hour. Any overall or very specific or any questions whatsoever? Overall or very specific or any questions whatsoever? Remember, you're welcome yep. to type them into the chat as well. It's looking like we are probably good. Who here uses Windows?
specifically, I want to make sure that y'all know how to bring up a terminal on Windows. And if you don't, that I make sure you figure that, that I figure out how you do. Okay. Yeah, that was that was one of the nice things about this example, just because Perfect. you can ignore that whole thing starting out, but eventually you're going to want to actually use Git for your projects. But eventually you're going to want to actually use Git for your projects. Okay. Um, I think that we are all set with you, Lowell. I appreciate greatly you coming out to uh, talk with us today. As you noted, this is one of the less flashy uh, talks that we're having, but I think it's actually one of the more important ones because um, Git can be really hard to make your way into without knowing all of the language um, or having someone with immediate access to the language. And I think you gave Great. us a really good overview of that. So thank you very much. Um, Last chance for anyone to ask Lowell some questions and then we'll let him go and just talk about what's coming and what you guys might like to see more of. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks Lowell, for having me. For joining us. Have fun. Thanks for having me. <laughs>